Oh, so today we're talking about Shadow, the faction of ambition and instinct, which is to say lots of tricky, fun stuff, along with some really aggressive and interesting units. Shadow tends to have a lot of understated units in terms of health, but cards that are very, very aggressive and deal a lot of damage. Uh, we have Lifesteal, Deadly, and Infiltrate as keyword abilities that are particularly strong. You see a lot of interesting stuff going on. There's a lot of Graveyard Recursion, or rather Void Recursion, as the case may be. And uh, yeah, it's a really interesting faction with a lot of control potential and a lot of aggressive potential, which is why it fits very well into the Feln and Stonescar archetypes. So, um, first off, of course, we have Amethyst Monument, the Transmute 533 Puma with Lifesteal. Basic idea behind this card is uh, you get a nice little Puma. This card's a little bit better now that there is an Arjunport card that can take care of, take uh, advantage of it, which is to say the Paladin Oathbreaker. Uh, it is one of the weaker monuments in general, just because the Puma is a little bit understated. Life steals, not currently a big thing, but it could end up being a big thing in set two. So we don't see a lot of this Puma, mainly because Shadow just has more interesting things to do once it gets up to the higher uh, amounts of power. You want to play stuff like Witching Hour or uh, the Torment, uh, Whispers in the Void, or Vara, of course. Vara is probably the one that is most common. So there are a lot of things that generally like preclude people from trying to limit their deck to Amethyst Monuments, and uh, if they're going for like a more aggressive style, they're probably running the other monument. But it's a decently strong card in draft, just because it gives you an extra unit that is also sometimes a power, and that's always good in draft. Uh, it's a pretty solid card in general for just like uh, giving you a lot of trade. It can be a little bit underrated, but uh, overall this card's just a little bit below average in both ranked and draft. I think it's uh, solid enough you can pick it up for certain types of drafts. Blood Beetle, Infiltrate, plus one attack and flying. This card is extremely good on turn one if you're on the play. It's not nearly as good on turn one if you're not on the play. It's surprisingly difficult to get Blood Beetle across for damage, which is why it tends to be sort of not that great in draft. It's a, it's a pretty decent card if you want to push aggressive flyers, and there's a lot of cases where it's going to get across damage that you wouldn't otherwise want it to, like, you wouldn't otherwise expect it to get across damage. Like, basically, draft decks just don't always have a unit on turn two. This is one of the many ways that you can punish people for not having a unit on turn two. That's also a way that you can force them to, like, respond to things like Rapid Shot in a way that is actually very bad for them. So Blood Beetle makes Rapid Shot particularly good. The more Rapid Shots you are, there are in your deck, the better it is in draft. Um, but, uh, yeah, in general, it is just, like, a really decent cheap flyer in draft. In ranked, doesn't see a lot of play, but uh, you you can, again, try to force things through with sort of film infiltrate type stuff. There are a couple of film tempo decks that can occasionally benefit from Blood Beetle. I think it's a little bit unreliable for like really professional rank decks, but you never know. Dark Return, draw a unit from the void and give it plus one plus one. This card is pretty solid in both ranked and draft. Uh, it is a card that essentially is not technically a unit but in most senses functions as one. You do actually have to have a unit on the board and have the unit get killed before Dark Return will get it back. But not only does it get it back and get it back with style, uh, it, generally that plus one plus one bonus does end up being relevant. The really nice thing about Dark Return is that it uh, creates a draw effect, which means that since you are getting the unit from, back from the void, it's still gonna trigger things like Echo, which creates a copy of the unit with the plus one plus one intact. It's going to trigger Destiny, draw you new cards, it's going to trigger Fate Effects, it's going to do a lot of those types of things, and that can generally be really relevant. Uh, mainly the plus one plus one is what makes it uh, particularly special, but this is the premier Void Recursion card in set one. This is the thing that you use if you want to get stuff back from the Void. Uh, Grasping at Shadows is a little bit more unreliable, doesn't give you that awesome bonus. Dark Return is just really, really good at getting a unit and getting it back and letting you do some cool things with it. So, pretty solid card. Uh, very 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 good in draft because just recurring units are extremely strong this can work very well with power surge units like copper conduit which is to say that if you play a power surge unit, if you play copper conduit down copper conduit becomes like a 5-5 five five, say because you played five mana for it then it dies you dark return it and you play it again and it is now like an 11-11 because you paid another five power for it and that's 10 plus dark return is 11. So yeah, that's a really solid uh, style that you can run with. You can also use dark return to bring back cards 
tournaments like Umbran Reaper. Crazy good times in ranked if you're doing those kinds of things. Uh, high impact in tomb units and high impact summon units are really, really strong targets for Dark Return. Dire Fang Spider. 1-1 one, one Deadly for 1. In draft, this card is pretty underrated. Pretty good at basically stalling out the board and forcing your opponent to slow down, respect your health total a little bit, and basically just not be able to push in with his big stuff. In ranked, you don't see a lot of it just because it's a little bit under underneath the curve on rate and it's very likely to get silenced, but uh, as a silence sort of bait, it's actually pretty decent. I think the card is pretty alright. It's not amazing in ranked. It's a decent enough pickup in draft, about average on that front. Ghost Form. This one is give a unit lifesteal and unblockable this turn. Uh, card is one of the worst cards that you can basically cast in terms of overall just value like it is a one cost card with a minimal effect that does not draw you anything or affect the board in any way it just increases your life total and then sometimes give you gives you cool infiltrates that being said using it to trigger powerful infiltrates can be very very strong so you can use this to set up say Jeral Iceheart or Arjun Port Ringmaster or Beast Collar, Direwood Beast Collar, of course, is always a card that has a really, really strong infiltrate and always wants to get through. In those types of decks, it can be pretty all right. You can also use it on like very, very big cards like Recurring Nightmare, uh, if they are like around a 16-1 or something like that. Getting that lifesteal can not only buy you a lot of time, but also get through the infiltrate for that last bit of damage. So Ghost Form's pretty all right for ranked types of decks. It's almost exclusively awful in draft unless you have exactly the right types of intel traits for it. Like this is a card that you pick up if you've already drafted an Arch Import Ringmaster, um, but uh, pretty rare that you want it in draft. Knife Jack, 2-2 two, two, summon, deals 2 damage to you. I would not recommend this card in draft at all. I think that the drawback is actually so strong that it is genuinely quite bad for you. Knifejack doesn't trade well with most things. Uh, it is pretty decently aggressive, but that extra two health, or that extra point of health, doesn't really mean anything, and most one drops are two ones uh, already. So, like, it doesn't really do much to be a two two. I think that overall, Knifejack is just kind of nice because it is an aggressive unit uh, with two attack at one for uh, the shadow decks, and if you're playing something super aggressive in shadow, then knife jack works out in that type of ranked deck. In draft, it'll usually punish you, it'll get you a decent amount of damage, it'll deal damage to you, it'll trade with something that's probably like a two drop, which sort of feels okay, and then you, that two damage will matter later on in the game. I, I don't like knife jack for most decks, I do think it's pretty alright if you're running the uh, correct amount of uh, aggressive stuff combined with Shadowlands Guide in ranked, so you can do some fun things with one drops in those types of decks. Hilfer, draw the top card of the enemy deck. Uh, this card's fun tech, good sideboard card or like a, an anti-meta card if you're, you're feeling the need to really steal something important. There aren't that many decks that it does very good against. The main thing that you can notice about this card is that it is actually pretty easy to sub in this card in place of something like Seek Power. It essentially functions as about one-third of a Seek Power, so if you're trying to calculate exa out exactly how much like power you have in your deck, Pilfer counts a little bit towards that count. Anything below two that potentially gets you power is pretty good on that front. However, Pilfer's big strength is picking Warcried units, Echo units, and basically anything that your opponent has put on top of his deck for the purposes of manipulating uh, and basically just taking those cards and doing very, very terrible things with them. It's a good thing to steal Clockroaches with or uh, Echoed Channel the Tempests, Echoed Static Bolts. There's a lot of fun things that you can do with this card, but it doesn't see a lot of play in Ranked. I actually do like it as a filler card in Draft. I think that it's a good way to just sort of get, again, a little bit of extra, like, just sort of stuff in there. A little bit of extra um, Seek Power a little bit of extra power seeking, and then also be a decent filler card. It's a little below average in rate, but it's certainly worth picking up. And if your deck's not uh, feeling particularly strong, this is a good filler. Rapid Shot. Give a unit plus four attack and quick draw this turn. Yes, I agree. Pilfer would be great if it was a fast spell. I would really like it to be a fast spell, except that I would also really hate that because I really like Carpet Shuffle decks. <laughs> Okay, so give it unit plus four attack and quick draw this turn. We actually know this card is getting nerfed. It's going up to two, which is probably a result of lifesteal cards getting better in set two. 
Uh, it might be a result of this card just being generally kind of strong. Like, it is a very good burn card, and it's a very good card for aggro-oriented decks. This is one of the strongest fast spells that you can pick up in uh, Ranked. It is a really, really good trick that always ends up with either a unit on the board being dead or uh, a, an amount of damage that is actually quite meaningful. In draft, once it goes up to two, it will still be a good card. That extra four damage will be relevant. That quick draw will be relevant. It's going to be a very, very good combat trick. In ranked, I think that's actually also going to be the case. It's not going to be as fast on rate, but it's still going to be a card you play in things like Stonescar Burn, because Stonescar Burn really has some things that it wants to do on its turn where it's just being aggressive and in general rapid shot is going to help that strategy i don't think the nerf's actually going to hurt it that much as a card i think that it's a very strong card as it is right now and i think that increasing the cost does not decrease the value of the card significantly in this case however it does mean that aggro decks will get slower and as a result you'll see like a you know, like in general, this deck, this card will be just a little bit less powerful, a little bit less likely to be picked. But it's a good card in both ranked and draft, and you can pick it in both, and it'll work in pretty much any deck at this point. Any deck with units, that is. Sabotage. The enemy player discards a spell or attachment of your choice from their hand. Use this card if you know what you're doing. I don't like this card because I just have terrible luck with it. I'm not a big fan of Treachery or Sabotage because I find them... Uh, I, I find that I when I cast them a disproportionate amount of the time, I hit nothing. And when you hit nothing with Sabotage, you have essentially just cost yourself a card, which is the big risk of playing with Sabotage. The advantage with Sabotage is that you can pick out some cards that are really, really relevant. You can pick out Rise to the Challenge cards. You can pick out cards that your opponent needs to counter your aggressive strategy. This card is currently a staple in a film tempo list that actually runs four of them because all it wants to do is just aggress you with a bunch of really really cheap units and the only thing it cares about is that your hand doesn't have lightning storms in it. So yeah, sabotage is pretty good for basically making sure that your opponent is a little bit less interactive with you. I think overall the card's bad on rate. Uh, it's not amazing in draft but it's okay. It's not amazing in ranked but it's right the right in the right types of decks. Slumbering Stone. In Tomb, play a 2-2 Gargoyle with Flying. Slumbering Stone is a pretty powerful card in both Draft and Ranked. The main reason is that it is very, very good at both stalling for health in the same way that Dire Fang Spider is capable of stalling for health, and also being a useful sacrifice outlet for later card advantage. There are a lot of cards that really like to eat cards like Slumbering Stone, Ravenous Thorn Beast, Combust, and Devour amongst them, and there are a lot of times where you might actually just want to block like 5 damage, save a bunch of health, and then get a free 2-2 flyer for 1. That's really not a bad deal. Slumbering Stone's a crazy good card for that particular respect. It is not a good card for aggressive damage decks, because if you play this down in an aggressive deck, there's no guarantee that it's ever going to get killed, so you're not going to get a cheap flyer out of it. You mainly use it for value decks and control decks, which is to say callous decks, decks that are using Devour and Madness, decks that are using Ravenous Thorn Beast. Uh, I think it is an incredible pickup in draft. It's actually very, very good on value, uh, probably like a solid B card for draft, because it doesn't actually... Uh, influence the board in a tremendous amount of a, we a way, but a 2-2 flyer for cheap is still really, really good. Suffocate. Kill a unit with three power or less. This card is just really powerful removal. Um, I think it's actually one of the better removal spells in the game. It is not a fast spell, but uh, it is still something that gets rid of a lot of things that are really, really threatening to you, and sets you up in a solid control archetype. In addition, there are a lot of units with 3 power or less that are actually pretty good. Uh, Combray Healer, Steward of the Past, Statuary Maiden. There are a lot of things where uh, it's just trying to be slightly under 4 power and suffocate as a card that gets those cards out of the way. So if you have a particular hatred for Karmic Guardians or or any other any other on a long list of things, Suffocate is a card for you. I recommend running around three of them in a lot of different rank decks. I recommend picking this up in draft as many times as you can, because it's always going to get something, and uh, removal is just generally good in draft. Annihilate. Kill a unit with a single faction. Another extremely powerful removal spell. This one hates on 
single colored units and that's one of the reasons why multicolored units are way way stronger than single colored units in a lot of different instances uh, just being hybrid is actually really important here because annihilate is such a good card for getting rid of cards that are essentially not hybrid this card killed sandstorm kills sandstorm titan which means that it's something that you should definitely be running four of in your early decks where you're like really really afraid of sandstorm titan uh, i think it's usually around a three of in most decks and and of course, it's something that you pick up in draft because it is very, very solid removal. Annihilate is great on rate. It is not particularly flexible. It hits about half of the enemy units, and uh, the ones that it hits often aren't the ones that you want to hit. But in the cases where it does hit what you want to hit, it's still a really good card. And most of the time, it's going to get you a lot of uh, value for your particular punch. So very, very good card in both ranked and draft. Oh yeah, Seraph. Seraph's another good suffocate target, you are correct. Argentport Instigator, when a unit dies, deal one damage to its owner. 3-3 three, three for two. One of the best two drops in the game, actually. This card is a 3-3, three, three, which means that it is an exceptionally well-statted unit. It does have a legitimate drawback, which is that uh, you can, of course, just get torched with it, and you will be lower down on tempo. But this isn't the same as the Knifejack drawback, where you always take a bunch of damage, and uh, life just kind of sucks for you as soon as that card goes away. Argentport Instigator is more likely to actually leverage its drawback, back into extra damage for you and as a result it is a staple of the stone scar deck i think it's a very very powerful card in draft as well just for that rate uh, overall just being a 3 3 for 2 is a very very efficient unit it can trade with a lot of different things the fact that it is torchable is basically meaningless because it only costs two to play in the first place uh, you do obviously lose some tempo if you take enough damage and if you play it with tokens and you get lightning stormed uh, that kind of hurts but it is a two drop that is immune to lightning storm which means you play it in token decks anyways uh, instigators crazy good on rate it's crazy good on aggression and it's really really just a generally fast and wonderful card you can even play it in some control decks just because it's such a big dude to be playing down on two that it's kind of defensive. Um, but I wouldn't highly recommend it in those types of decks. It's more for the aggressive style, and it's definitely a draft bomb. Or not quite a bomb, but a very strong draft card. Cabal Cutthroat, 2-2 two, two Lifesteal, one of the worst two drops in the game, unfortunately. Uh, I really like this card. Well, I I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of this card, but I do kind of have a thing for the underdog he hasn't done a lot of amazing things yet but lifesteal is pretty likely to get better in uh, uh later sets there's currently an argent port card that is uh leveraging that and we'll talk about that when we get to it but uh, in general this card just doesn't do quite enough the lifesteal effect isn't as good as the quick draw and war cry on rakano outlaw it's not as good as the aegis on crown aegis and war cry on crown watch paladin so cabal cutthroat kind of falls by by the wayside as being just a little bit understated for a two drop he's good to put units on he's good to put uh a rapid shot on and he can gain you a lot of health in an aggro matchup which means that he's a pretty good sub in if your aggro decks are basically just facing off against a bunch of other aggro decks but the main problem is that he's pretty vulnerable to light removal which most aggro decks are going to have so he rarely gets that life steal and he just kind of gets uh plinked away before anything cool happens with him still he's an okay card nothing special uh, i think i would recommend him in draft because life steal is a pretty powerful effect and because you can stack rapid shots on them in and also stack a bunch of weapons on him and either of those make cabal cutthroat a sight to behold so he's a reasonable pick in draft dark wisp Entomb draw a card, two cost, one, one. This card is essentially a cycle a card card. It works very well with any type of sacrifice effect, like Devour, Thorn Beast, and Combust once again. Uh, it is overall not amazing. Like, it does work in Callus decks. It works in anything where you have sacrifice outlets. I think you should run it in ranked if you have those sacrifice outlets, and I think you should run it in draft if you have those sacrifice outlets. Uh, in draft, it is largely a filler card if you don't have sacrifice outlets, but you're probably going to get a few if you're drafting... Uh, shadow because most of the sacrifice out outlets you're looking for are in common and they're uncommonly good so dark wisp is a pretty reasonable card to pick up in draft because you're expecting some good synergy with it as a card by itself it is equivalent to temple scribe but a little bit easier to cast and uh, generally doesn't do quite as much to affect the board state but i think that extra draw card can be very beneficial and can even stall the opponent from attacking you for a while which is really really nice Devour, sacrifice a unit to draw two cards and get two health. In combination with Dark Wisp, this is a draw three cards, get two health. Really, really fun card. So it's two cards for one, for three, which isn't amazing, but uh, still a really good card 
to basically get a little bit of that health advantage does count and the draw effect is actually very powerful so if you're getting rid of anything that you just don't need anymore like a permafrosted unit or a unit that's about to die anyways because devour is a fast spell so you can respond to torches then this is a really really powerful card i actually think that it is a one of the more powerful draw spells in the game and uh, because of the way that you can use it to respond to other spells you basically nullify a unit your opponent was going to kill anyways and then draw two cards and that's sort of a three for one but not quite it's a little bit like that uh, and the two health actually ends up mattering so devour is a very very strong card you need the right type of units to eat with it but you can also use it to uh, defend units that you would otherwise not want to be silenced like umbran reaper or of course dark wisp so yeah devour is really really fun a uh, very good card in draft if you can get the sacrifice for it like basically any sort of token any sort of dark wisp pretty much anything i i think that Dar devour is worth picking up in draft you can even like eat a with rye ranger as it's getting torched but for the most part it's uh just a, an okay card in draft and in ranked it's very very good for all of the different types of decks that it runs in uh devour and madness is a very very powerful combo so we'll talk about that in a second <coughs> Lathrai Ranger, 2-2, two, two, Infiltrate, plus 2, plus 2. Doesn't seem much play in Ranked, because again, a 2-2 two, two for 2 without a lot of abilities is not likely to actually get through for damage, and uh, as a result, it doesn't get to be a 4-4 four, four as often, but you still see it in some tempo decks, and it can be okay in those respects. In Draft, this is just absolutely bananas and probably the best 2-drop that you can get. Uh, it is more than likely to punish about half of your opponent's decks for not having a 2-drop, and if it does that, you get a card that is so big on tempo that it's actually really likely to cost your opponent the game on swing. They'll have to spend removal on it, and that alone is really, really good because them spending removal on your two drops is really important. Like, you want them to waste out their removal so that you can basically have, like, a much better game with your other big stuff. But uh, in general, Lothroy Ranger is just also capable of continually coming back with Dark Return, getting bigger and bigger. It's a really terrifying threat in draft. There's a lot of different fun ways that it can play out. And I think that overall, it's very, very strong in that respect. Uh, infiltrate cards are really fun. You can do a lot of cool things with this card. And there are some inf Infiltrate decks and ranked that are pretty fun to play this with. Scavenging Vulture. Plus one attack while you have a unit in the void. This card is basically no good in ranked unless you are playing a Beast Collars Amulet deck and you really, really need a lot of small flyers to get the Beast Collars Amulet across. In draft, it is a pretty good card because you will usually get that plus one attack, meaning you have a two cost, two one flyer. That's about stock average and it's not bad at all. There are a lot of things that kill units with one health, which makes Scavenging Vulture a little bit weaker. Uh, I don't like how sort of inflexible it is and how even just for the two one flyer, you have to have something happen just to make it enabled. So Vulture's not really high on my list of draft cards, but I think he's strong enough to actually make an appearance, and he is a decent enough 2-drop to be played. Sporefolk, summon, discard the top 5 of your cards of your deck. Very rare that you want this in draft. In ranked, this is a premier card for reanimator-style decks that want to put cards into their voids so that they can bring them back from their void and do fun things with them. You can also use this to enable cards like Ephemeral Wisp or Dawnwalker that come back from the void of their own volition. So Sporefolk can do a lot of cool things. Also, that is a discard effect. So discard effects that affect, that affect cards in your hand. Uh, the, there is only one of those at the moment, but Privilege of Rank is another card that Sporefolk can hit. Sporefolk's very good for ranked synergies. It's good for digging through your deck to find a particular type of card like Vara and then get it back with Dark Return. Uh, in draft, it is just not good enough on rate and it usually doesn't do any of the cool things that you want. In ranked, it's a very cool card in Reanimator and Haunting Scream decks. Uh, doesn't see a lot of play just because it's not very good on its own and doesn't provide any extra value, but if you can use it to cheat out a Scourge of Frost Home, then mm, more power to you. That's definitely a strong way to go about it. Vampire Bat, 1-1 one, one Flying Lifesteal, 4-2. Not especially strong in ranked. There's a couple of plays you can make with it, with like Paladin Oathbook and Argentport stuff. Uh, Paladin Oathbreaker as well also kind of likes it, but it's still pretty low on rate. It doesn't do a lot of damage. 
the lifesteal ends up being not terribly relevant. It is a good card to equip in draft, but it's also a little bit weak, and I'm not even sure if you can get it in draft. So, yeah, not an amazing card uh, by any particular stretch of the imagination, but uh, once lifesteal gets better, we'll take a look at this card and evaluate it again. Vara's Favor. Deal one damage, draw a shadow sigil from your deck. Card's pretty exceptional. It's actually the best favor in the game. So it functions not only as a removal spell, but also as a removal spell that draws you a free shadow sigil from your deck and fixes your power. That's amazing. This card is incredibly strong. Uh, you should be picking it up in both draft and ranked. You should probably have like three to four of these in most of your draft and ranked decks. This card is really, really good at getting you up to your later game. It's even good in aggro decks because aggro decks just want to deal with a lot of little chump one blockers and they want to do it without costing themselves cards for flame blast or things like that later. So yeah, Forest Favor is pretty crazy. I think that it's a really exceptional card. Definitely want to play it. Strongest of the favors. Very, very good. Venom Fang Dagger, plus one, plus one, and deadly. So this card doesn't do an amazing amount of cool things, but I will mention the fun combos that you can use with it, which if you draft them, in, if you set them up in draft, are even more fun because there's less likely to be an actual response to that. Uh, the main thing with deadly is putting it on quick draw. It means that you basically can't be blocked by anything. Uh, but the other thing that really makes Venom Fang Dagger fun is that if you are to take a card like Stormcaller, which is not in purple, so let's go ahead and just do that. Uh, and exhaust it to deal one damage. That one damage is deadly, so you can just use it to pinpoint target any unit and remove it from the board. And just get yourself a little pea shooter that kills everything. So that's really fun. Venom Vang Dagger is kind of cool for that particular effect. I haven't seen a lot of other fun synergies with it, but there's a few floating around, so you could run it in particular rank decks that want to run that kind of thing. In draft, it's not a great pickup, but again, putting it on quick draw makes things unblockable. There's always going to be something you can put it on that'll be okay, so you might end up running it if you just really don't have anything better to do. Uh, pretty low on the uh, overall chain of draft cards. Amethyst Acolyte, an extremely strong draft card that is almost strong enough to be run in ranked. Not amazing on rate, but uh, the negative one, negative one effect kills a lot, a lot of draft commons, and also is very, very good for basically just uh, messing up Aegises, uh, weakening your opponent's big drops so that they are more vulnerable to other things. Just generally making things like a lot worse for your opponent. Like, you can also give things like negative attacks so that they are vulnerable to suffocate, or like just do, yeah, a wide variety of special things. I think this is probably the strongest Acolyte. Um, Cobalt Acolyte and Amber. Well, uh, no, Amber Acolyte is probably the strongest Acolyte, but Amethyst Acolyte is dang close, and Amethyst Acolyte is definitely the strongest Acolyte in draft, just because that ability to just take out a unit can be really, really effective when your opponents are playing a lot of little one drops, which they almost always pl are playing at least a few. Crazy good card, uh, also makes good sacrifice fodder for Devour or Thorn Beast later, so that overall lack of stats doesn't really matter as much in terms of shadow. Beast Colors Amulet. Infiltrate, play a 5-5 five, five beast. So this is a 3 cost 1-0. This card is probably better than Direwood Beast Color in a lot of different situations. Um, there are some Feln aggro decks that will agree with me in ranked. In draft, this card is just a bananas bomb because you can stick it on any sort of flyer and just immediately swing the game with a 3 cost 5-5 five, five, in addition to a plus 1 bonus to your flyer, which puts that flyer into a position where it is actually very dangerous. I think this card is a really good draft card. You should definitely be drafting it along with a bunch of flyers if you can. Uh, very, very good piece of equipment. And uh, the surprise effect of it, the fact that you can play it on a unit and then get a 5-5 beast out of it without your opponent actually having a chance to respond to it is what makes it ex especially powerful. Uh, that's also what makes it powerful in ranked. It's pretty crazy for that particular reason. Uh, there is an alternative to this card, Direwood Beast Caller, which we'll discuss in a moment, and has a more powerful effect. But Beast Caller's amulet is a little bit more um, versatile and can be used in a lot more situations without getting you killed. Blackguard Sidearm, 2-1 Quick Draw. Uh, this card costs 3. The overall bonus is that it mostly makes your units unblockable, which makes it a good card in draft for pushing damage and being really, really aggressive. Overall, the stat line's not great, but that Quick Draw effect is actually very powerful, and you can put it on a lot of different things. 
Uh, fun on Dire Fang Spider, but not actually good. Uh, fun on a bunch of stuff. You do get one extra health on your one drops, so that's kind of nice. You can put on like an Amethyst Acolyte. Basically, it's just a decent draft weapon that does pretty well. In ranked, um, a little too slow. Not good enough to be played. There's much better better pieces of equipment that you can be playing on three, and most of the time you're also going to be wanting to play a bevy of really good three drops on three. So Black Guard Sidearm doesn't see as much play in that particular uh, archetype. But I do like it for Oni Quartermaster decks with, um, what's the card? Brazen Daredevil? That can be really fun. <laughs> Overall, just a little bit too low on rate. Cabal Countess, 4-1 Ambush, Ultimate, play, pay 4 to give Cabal Countess plus 2 attack and quick draw. This card was a relatively new addition to open beta. I despise the art, uh, but other than that, I think it's a really, really good card. So the obvious weakness to Cabal Countess is that it has 1 health and is therefore vulnerable to Vara's favor and a wide variety of other things. It also costs 7 to make it a 6-1, which really actually not that big a deal. Uh, most of the time you'll even want to do it just because playing it down as an ambush unit on 3 is usually a really good idea, and then you can just basically turn it into a 6-1 on 4, get 6 damage, and if you're a Stone Scar deck, that's all the damage you need to really push for obliterates and flame blasts later in the game. So Cabal Countess is a Real, real fun for that. Um, so we've got the uh, two shadow influence that makes it a little bit deep, but uh, yeah, in general we have like just kind of some main, oh, hang on a sec. Yeah, the, the cool thing about this card is that it can be played as a removal card to get rid of some other things. Usually don't want to do that, but uh, in draft that's actually like a really powerful effect. And uh, since you know you're there's gonna be a lot of like small like things to kill one drops then that can also be crazy but a 6-1 with quick draw is also a really really good damage pusher this card tends to do way too much damage to your opponent and uh, if you can hit even twice with it or if you can hit twice with it the game is almost over at that point it's crazy crazy good uh, it's very very good in ranked decks and it's really really solid in draft I would say it's a draft bomb even because it is a large evasive unit that you can even play for very cheaply Desperado, infiltrate, kill an enemy unit for a 3-2. Double Shadow is actually the only thing that makes Desperado a bad card for me. Um, he's not played a lot in ranked. I think he's still a very good effect. The main reason that he's not played in ranked is because Gorgon... Um, Gorgon Infiltrator. Gorgon Infiltrator? Gorgon Fanatic is the uh, card that just has a much better infiltrate effect. But Desperado actually gets you a lot more value on board, and that means that he is sometimes a much more reasonable card to be playing uh, rather than Gorgon Fanatic. I think he gets undervalued entirely because of Gorgon Fanatic, and he is by himself a very powerful card. Not only does, is that infiltrate effect very, very good, like he usually gets it through because you can just remove a unit, kill a unit, and like basically force your opponent into a situation where he's trying to block with all of his units just so that he doesn't lose value to Desperado. Uh, but in general, like he's just all, very likely to get through and get that unconditional kill, which is crazy fun for him. And then, you know, he's also a card that can be Haunting Screamed. That's a really, really important thing for good Infiltrate effects. And uh, in this case, Desperado is just crazy solid on that front. The only thing that's not good about him is that there are two extremely comparable 3-drops with extremely powerful Infiltrates. So he tends to get uh, locked out of that slot. I think he's a very strong pick in Draft. Uh, one of the better cards you can pick in Draft. Devouring Shadow. I have a premium version of this. I do not. Give a unit negative one, negative one for each of your shadow influence. I don't think you can play this in draft, but in ranked it is actually a reasonable card that tends to fall by the wayside. It's mostly that it's a little bit more expensive than Annihilate and a little bit more conditional. It doesn't get rid of all of the things that you necessarily want it to, and most people aren't playing mono shadow, which is where this card really, really comes in handy. Uh, you can do some things like use strangers to boost the shadow influence in these, this card and make it a little bit more powerful, and that can be pretty solid, but overall he's just a little bit hard to fit into a ranked deck. <laughs> I think if your ranked deck is generating enough shadow, Devouring Shadow is actually worth it as a removal spell, but most of the time he doesn't see a lot of play. Direwood Beast Collar, Infiltrate, play 255 Beasts. By far the most powerful Infiltrate for its cost. 
Uh, that ability is just a game winner, and hitting even once with it means that your opponent pretty much has to harsh rule or lose the game. Uh, that means that Direwood Beast Color is pretty crazy in some respects. Uh, he's a very powerful ranked card. You can play him in Haunting Scream decks, and that's the primary reason that you run him. Uh, the 1-1 one, one is a really, really meaningful lack of body. He doesn't do a whole heck of a lot, but uh, he does, when he is played down, force your opponent to go immediately into defense mode and start playing reactionary to you. If he doesn't have the right card to react to Direwood Beast Color, Direwood Beast Color will close the game out just really right quick. It's a really, really good card for that, and uh, for that reason alone, I think that it's a very, very good card in ranked. Uh, in draft, I am okay with this card. Uh, the Infiltrate effect, again, is very, very powerful. You're going to have less opportunities to get this card through, and there's more options where Bi Beast Color will just, like, sit very still for a bunch of turns and then not do anything, and then it'll get Snowballed or Amethyst Acolyte or um, Lightning Storm or any number of removal spells, and you'll just get uh, knocked off the board before he actually gets to play those two beasts. But if you have enough ways to get him across, he is an absolute bomb in draft because, of course, getting those two 5-5 five -five beasts is crazy swing so uh be careful of this card it can be a trap in draft but if you have the right synergies it is an absolute bomb and likewise ranked decks always have the right synergies which makes them a very very strong card in that respect execute kill an exhausted enemy unit and deal two damage to the enemy player pretty solid in ranked doesn't see a lot of play but uh, unconditional removal is still pretty okay uh the main problem is that if something hits you in ranked it often hits you for like five or six which is too much damage to be taking before you are removing a threat and then execute is also a little bit expensive uh not quite as expensive as Death Strike, but also not as flexible. In draft, this card is a really, really solid common removal that you should be picking up pretty much every time you see it, because it hits everything, and then it gets rid of that thing, and then you also does damage back to your opponent, which is very important for tempo swings. Uh, Execute is just a crazy good draft card, A+, plus, very, very solid, uh, wonderful card to be playing in draft, because unconditional removal is very strong, and that tempo swing is actually important. The Thry Nightblade, 2-2 two, two, unblockable, 4-3. Not an amazing card in ranked. Most of the time, unblockable is the equivalent of flying. There are not that many situations where you have a flying unit and you're like, man, I really wish this were just unblockable instead. Uh, but what you are paying for with Lothrai Nightblade is definitely that unblockable effect. Because as you can see, the 2-2 two -two body is not very big for a 3-drop unit. Um, this card, of course, does work well with Beast Colors Amulet and any other weapon that you can equip on it. As a result, it's a pretty strong card in draft as long as you can get the right synergies with it. I think overall, the lack of rate just makes this card pretty underwhelming, and I find it a little bit dull, but it is good at sneaking across any number of cool infiltrate effects and sneaking across damage in tight races and draft. Life Drinker, 2-2 two -two summon, you get lifesteal this turn. This card kills a 2-2 two -two and then gets you like 2 health back because you gain 2 health off the armor and then you also got 2 health off the lifesteal. So, interesting anti-aggro card, very very good for sort of picking up on small things. The main problem with it is that it is not a 3 attack weapon, and that means that it can't hit a lot of very nasty threats in ranked, including Champion of Glory and Argentport Instigator, which are pretty nasty threats in general. Um... The lovely thing about Life Drinker, and the thing that's really, really fun about it, is that relic weapons that give you skills affect damage dealing spells, which is to say that if you equip Life Drinker, you get lifesteal for the turn, which means that your torches have lifesteal, your flame blasts have lifesteal, your obliterates have lifesteal, and uh, pretty much anything else that you can think of that is a spell has lifesteal. So Life Drinker can have some really, really fun giant damage swings where you can play it out and then play a lightning storm and gain about like 20 life off of just wiping the whole board crazy fun way to just get a huge amount of advantage out of a board. Um, I really like it as a sort of uh, low-end drop that's not particularly good in ranked, but has some really fun high-end synergies. Uh, overall, this card does not push a ranked game one way or the other. It's merely a pretty good filler card that usually pulls its weight 
in some types of decks. I've seen it played in Armory. I've seen it played in a lot of other things. Uh, it's not amazing, and it's not being used a lot right now, but I think it's going to get a lot better, especially if Lifesteal becomes important. And uh, in Draft, I would definitely pick this card up. It uh, does represent a good tempo swing, and it is removal for fairly cheap. So definitely worth picking up. You'd probably value it under Execute, but above most other things. Madness, ready and steal an enemy unit this turn. Oh, cool, came to. I like you. I'm glad you like the uh, Elysian midrange deck. Okay, so madness, crazy strong card. Uh, this card does not actually do anything in terms of card advantage, and this is like something of a theme that we're seeing with the early shadow cards. They don't really care about card advantage, they're very focused on doing any particular thing kind of suicidally and sacrificing some other element in as a result of it. Like there's that ambition uh, uh, sort of shining through, but madness is pretty crazy fun. So this, <coughs> ooh, yeah, I definitely needed the water. Hold on a sec. This card does represent a pretty crazy swing in damage. Generally gets like a 6-6 six, six across, and then you hit them in the face with it, and that's really, really good. That can be the game-winning play just all by itself if you're an aggressive deck, which means that Madness is a pretty cool card in quite a bit of Stonescar Rush decks and quite a few Feln Aggro decks. It's just really, really fun in those decks, and it does pretty decent amounts of uh work. But the main thing that it really shines at is Madness can be used to steal a unit and then devour, combust, uh, Stone Scar, Callus, Bloodright Callus. Uh, anything that sacrifices a unit after you have Maddest it sends that unit to your void. It is not the magic system. You just get that unit in your own void where you can Dark Return, Grasping at Shadows, or do whatever you want to get that unit back at your leisure. It's also a really good way to shut down cards like Dawnwalker and other things like that. Um, Madness Devour is incredibly good rate. It's a very good way to remove a unit from your opponent's board, not have to sacrifice one of your own units, and then draw a bunch of cards. That's typically three for four for two advantage is that right yeah it, it's it's a significant amount of swing and also you get the damage out of it you oftentimes get a cool infiltrate madness is also a card that just by having it you can negate some types of decks such as beast caller and fanatic decks madnessing a fanatic on turn three is just an easy way to immediately get a surrender out of your opponent i like this card a lot i think it's very very strong and i think it uh, definitely has a good place in particular in blood right callus decks and rank and in general, in draft, I think it's just a, a really good pickup. You do have to pick up a Thorn Beast or a Devourer to make it work, but it's well worth it. Plague. Enemy units get negative one, negative one for three. Uh, this card is on the weak side. It's used to clear out small uh, hordes of tokens and to basically like get really, really big threats into being slightly smaller ones, but there are usually better ways to do this than in Shadow, uh, so usually you will opt for other options. I think Plague is generally suffering from a lack of ability to completely close out a game, but the fact that it is enemy units only and uh, it is like mildly effective at clearing out hordes of tokens means that it can be okay in ranked and it can be okay in draft. Uh, obviously there are a lot of draft units that have only one health and Plague can definitely just kind of swing the game in your favor if you're running it, but there are so many situations where it doesn't work and it's actively a bad card for you that I find it a little worrisome in both instances. Probably worth picking up in draft, not really worth it in ranked. What if Plague was a relic? Uh, it would be very strong, I think. Not amazing. I wouldn't like it much better. Ravenous Thorn Beast. You may sacrifice another unit to give Ravenous Thorn Beast plus two plus two. A five five four three is not a bad deal. And of course, sacrificing a unit like Dark Wisp or um, any sort of Grenadine drone for a 5-5 five, five for 3 is not a bad deal at all. There's a lot of ways to get these big 5-5 five, five beasts in Shadow, and I think that overall it represents a reasonable damage swing. Thorn Beast doesn't see a lot of play in Ranked just because you have more powerful effects for sacrificing. 
But in draft, he's a very, very solid card. A 5-5 five, five for 3 is just a really, really good stat line. It's pretty hard to kill. Uh, there's not that many ways to remove it. And of course, there are plenty of cool sacrifice outlets available in draft, so you can usually find something for Thorn Beast to eat if you need to. Also, another sacrifice outlet for Madness, which is really, really good. Uh, plenty of ways that you can use this card. I think it is a decent pickup in draft. Scheme! Draw one of the top four cards of your deck, put the rest on the bottom. Intensely powerful card. Uh, obviously very, very good at picking up combos and getting you to whatever type of combo that you want. Uh, doesn't represent any card advantage, represents a significant tempo loss, but all of that just means that it is an exceptionally good combo card that is very, very good at digging for stuff. So this card represents uh, another theme of Shadow, which is just sort of this level of like picking up stuff and just generally like looking for really interesting and fun things to do. I think that Scheme is very, very good at just uh, setting up combo decks, and you should definitely be running it in certain types of control decks and combo decks because it digs very, very deep and gets you very, very important cards as a result. Uh, don't go too overboard with this if you are not capable of generating early tempo, but it can be the right card for the right types of situation. I think it's okay in draft as well. Definitely picks you up particular bombs if you need them. Uh, does represent, again, that significant tempo loss, so if your deck is just full of aggro creatures, probably don't bother. Shadowlands Guide. Summon play a unit with cost one or less from the void. There are a lot of good units with cost one or less, which makes Shadowlands Guide a pretty solid card in ranked and a pretty solid card in draft. Uh, main targets include Oni Ronin, Pyro Knight. Pyro Knight is probably the best one, just because Pyro Knight has an ability that can give it a plus something bonus. Uh, plus, it turned it into a 6-5, essentially, so plus 5, plus 4, yeah. And then... Uh, after that, if it dies again, you can Shadowlands Guide it back and give it another plus 5, plus 4, and just keep on doing that over and over again. So, yeah, Recursion on 1-drops is really, really strong. This card is pretty decent in quite a few Bandit Queen decks, and uh, Jito decks, which are decks that give units with 1 or less charge with Frontier Jito. Jito decks have fallen by the wayside a little bit, which has made Shadowlands Guide a little less popular and ranked, but overall, the value is definitely there. And uh, it's a very good card in draft as well, just because it's a reasonable blocker slash attacker that oftentimes gets you a decent amount of card advantage and value. Uh, in particular, getting back Dire Fang Spider in draft can be very, very strong. Torrent of Spiders. Play a 1-1 Deadly Spider. Play an additional spider for every three units that you have in the void. This spell can generate a truly tremendous amount of spiders, which can be very, very good for a lot of token strategies. Uh, there are some good token strategies in both red and uh, in both fire and time, and uh, there are actually some good fire time shadow decks that run Torrent of Spiders. Uh, this card also works very well in Stone Scar decks that are running Blood Rite Callus. I really like this card in general for just turning boards that have been cleared off with cards like Harsh Rule or Blood Rite Callus and uh, making them into basically tenable situations again. This card usually means a lot of card advantage and it can be a very good way to stall out your opponent as you set up your particular strategy. I like it a lot in Draft, I like it a lot in Ranked. Xenon Cultist. 2-4, whenever one of your other units is killed, that unit gets plus 2, plus 2. Uh, it is fairly well statted for a 3-drop. It's not amazing. It doesn't pressure damage, but it does live through Torch. So it's, uh, you know, kind of on the average side as far as things go. I think that overall it's a pretty good pickup in draft just because it's decently defensive and actually does stop 2-drops cold in their tracks. And then that uh, synergy where essentially anything of yours that dies gets plus two plus two as long as Xenos Cultist is on the board is pretty okay. You can use that to get some really magnificent dark returns. In ranked, there's not that many ways to make this card work, but Ephemeral Wisp and Dawnwalker are amongst them. And uh, of course, all of your fun sacrifice strategies work pretty well with Xenon Cultist. The main problem is that Xenon Cultist often won't stay alive for that long, but usually you're playing enough cards that uh, your opponent wants to kill other than Xenon Cultist, so that makes killing Xenon Cultist a pretty risky proposition. So there is some fun to be had there. It's particularly good in Haunting Scream decks, and I think that uh, that's a fun ranked thing to try out. Xenon Destroyer, Lifesteal Reckless 3-3. Three, three. For three, in fact, I would actually play this card in ranked. It's good enough on rate, and the lifesteal is actually pretty relevant. The recklessness means 
uh, is a drawback, of course, but it does mean that you always get to bluff Rapid Shot. And so if you're always bluffing Rapid Shot, and Rapid Shot is just the worst thing that can happen if your opponent blocks, with Z blocks a Xenon Destroyer, uh, Xenon Destroyer can get through for a surprisingly large amount of damage. Uh, I don't think it's an amazing ranked card. It is, however, a very, very good draft card. You draft this, of course, with a lot of removal and a lot of Rapid Shots and a lot of weapons and a lot of other things, but basically it's powerful enough on its own that it's usually going to get some value. It's not usually going to run into a wall unless it's in the late game, in which case, ouch. That's a, that's a, a set. I'm sorry for your lots. Uh, uh, you should have packed more Rapid Shots. But yeah, in general, this card is pretty neat. So I, I like it a lot. Uh, very solid draft three drop. Uh, not amazing and ranked, but has has some of the right stuff. Back alley bouncer, very boring. Four cost four three. You can pick it up in draft. It's okay there. It's not good and ranked at all. Wouldn't run it there at all. Um, doesn't do much. Vulnerable to torch. Vulnerable to vanquish. Four three is in my opinion one of the worst stat lines in Eternal. Uh, it's just vulnerable to everything, and that means it's really a bad card in ranked. In draft, it's meaty enough, but mostly just a filler card. Cabal Recruiter, 1-4, Infiltrate, play the top unit of the enemy deck. That Infiltrate effect is very powerful, especially since it can get cards that uh, your opponent would really like you not to have, specifically cards with giant war cries on top of them. I can see a world where Cabal Recruiter somehow comes out of a... Oh yeah, actually, uh, if you were to be playing against a, a, an armory deck, use Herald Song to discard Cabal Recruiter, Haunting Scream Recruiter, and then come back against the Akaria. That'd be kind of fun. But then the Akaria could block you, so you need like a ghost form in there as well. Yeah, you know, like Cabal Recruiter represents a reasonably strong swing in tempo in terms of draft decks. In ranked, the main problem here is that playing the top unit of the enemy deck is just not as strong as killing a unit on your opponent's board. Like, overall, uh, killing your opponent's board is a little bit more development, and also the unit that does that has more pressure and is just generally like a little bit more tenable. So Fall Recruiter has some weaknesses on that front, but it's a reasonably decent blocker. It's hard to kill for a 4-drop, and uh, it's pretty likely to levitate and get across for that top unit. So uh, maybe worth a try in ranked, but not amazing. And fun draft card. Deathstrike. Kill a unit. <laughs> gotta have a premium version of this all right <laughs> so straight up kill a unit unconditional removal double shadow uh cards not amazing but it's actually decent like you definitely do run this in a lot of control archetypes and ranked because obviously being able to unconditionally kill a unit is sometimes all that you ever want this card does not do very well in terms of overall tempo but it is really nice to be able to kill stuff uh, whenever you want to. The main problem here is that like four cost means that you're not going to be able to pop Aegis's and uh, get the Death Strike through that way. It's it's a pretty steep investment. It only kills things that are really, really big. But it does kill hybrid units, and killing hybrid units is often very important. There aren't a lot of things that die to Death Strike. There are, there are some things that die almost only to Death Strike, and Death Strike is pretty good for picking up those units and making sure that you don't get threatened by them again. Uh, definitely pick it up in draft. Unconditional removal is very strong. Uh, in ranked, it is for the slower control archetype and very occasionally for a faster, like, burn archetype, but never for a super aggressive archetype. You would want to run Annihilates instead. Impending Doom, 5-5 five, five Flyer. At the end of your turn, Impending Doom deals one damage to you. Crazy good stat line for the unit. The one damage to you is a legitimate drawback that often can cost you games. Uh, Impending Doom can even be played on a turn where you have one health and just kill you before anything else can happen. So uh, unplayable sometimes is one of those things about it that makes it a little bit weak. But the main thing about it is that it is just a really impressively rated flyer that does a ton of damage. This card is very, very strong in Stone Scar aggro decks and burn decks. It is very strong in Feln aggro decks and burn decks. It is just really, really good at being incredibly aggressive and not very good at all at being defensive. Uh, this card hurts a lot if it gets permafrosted because it just continues to sit on the board and deal one damage to you every turn. But that's a small price to pay for the overall stats and flying unit damage that you are basically beholding here. So yeah, Impending Doom, well worth it. A plus in both ranked and draft. Very, very solid card. Um... 
let's see here. Anything else to say about it? The You can give it life steal, and then it will deal one damage to you, and then give you one health. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things to do with it, uh, especially if it's Righteous Fury, because then it deals two damage to you, and you gain two health. <laughs> well, Thry Felchin, uh So, for one life steal, this card is pretty... Uh, let's see here. It is a good draft card for sure, because lifesteal is very strong. That amount of damage is very strong on a flyer, and uh, it's just a card that you put on a flyer to make that flyer just end the game for you very, very quickly. Uh, the swing is very, very good. The main problem here is, of course, that it doesn't offer you a lot of health, and cards that don't offer you a lot of health that are weapons usually get you in a situation where... Oh man, it's just really, really hard to play them because you're often just offering your opponent a two-for-one on their removal. But can be a good card for swinging against those aggro decks and can be pretty decent in that respect. Good card on Impending Doom, as uh, Catastrophial is noticing. So yeah, very strong card in draft. Uh, wouldn't recommend it, especially in ranked, but it does actually work fairly well as a counter to some uh, aggro decks, and I've actually used it uh, successfully uh, to that extent. Soul Collector, whenever another unit dies, Soul Collector gets plus one, plus one. In Tomb, you gain health equal to Soul Collector's health. Doesn't really work in Ranked, very powerful card in Draft, just because lots of stuff dies in Draft all the time. It's pretty hard to kill other things, and so Soul Collector can grow to truly monstrous proportions, or it can just draw removal, which is always important. Um, yeah, this card has to be dealt with, or else it will become pretty bananas, and then once it becomes pretty bananas, even if it's dealt with, you get that extra health swing out of Soul Collector, which is really, really fun. Uh, card's just not strong enough in ranked, it doesn't do enough, but, uh, fun nonetheless. Steward of the Past. Summon, silence all units in the enemy void. Enemy units entering the void are silenced. And look at those stats! Deadly 3-5. Really, really good. Steward of the Past is probably one of the stronger pushed cards in Shadow. It's meant to keep all of those Void shenanigans decks honest, and it does a pretty good job of that. I actually really like this card just in general. Uh, it is pretty well statted, pretty hard to kill for a lot of different reasons. Uh, is monocolored, so easy to kill with Annihilate at the very least. Does die to Suffocate as well. But uh, overall, it is a card that trades with a lot of different things because it is deadly. So uh, trades well with Sandstorm Titan, trades well with uh, just pretty much anything that your opponent can think of. It's Stonewall's aggro decks, which is really, really good. And then also it has that uh, enemy void silence effect. I think this card is pretty aces in draft, and I think it's also just a bananas good card in ranked. There is one alternative to Steward of the Past for Void Hate that is in Stonescar, which is a 2-4 that uh, turns units into cuddles when they die. And as fun as that is, I think Steward of the Past is just better. This card actually has enough damage to push pressure, and uh, the effect is really, really powerful. In particular, it is not only the enemy units entering the Void are silenced effect, but the summon effect itself targets your opponent, which pops Aegis's on your opponent, which is one other thing that you want to note about this card that makes it uh, kind of strong and kind of flexible. Steward of the Past has a lot of cool play to it. It's a really fun ranked card. I would say it's a ranked staple. Oh, and uh, that silence effect does silence in tombs as well. Always good to note that. Because we're going into Stone's Garmagus. In tomb, give an enemy unit negative two, negative two. In draft, this is a fairly strong card that gives you exceptionally good rate. Uh, basically, it usually trades two for one. Two for ones are really, really strong, and uh, Stone's Garmagus can be pretty crazy in that respect. You'll often sacrifice this to Combust or Devour or to Thorn Beast, or you'll just block with it and kill two two twos in one stone. Pretty nice times. Uh... In ranked, this card just doesn't do enough, and it's pretty likely to get silenced before you can actively uh, actively sacrifice it because it costs so much that it's very hard to play it down and also do a devour. Subvert. Draw a random card from the enemy player's hand. This is a draft bomb. Um, <laughs> this card is very frequently underrated, and I would say one of the more underrated cards in Eternal. Uh, this card does represent, of course to card advantage. So it's the same as Wisdom of the Elders. You are stealing a card from your opponent's hand and you are getting a card back for yourself. So Subvert will always represent at the very least a two for one on your opponent as long as you cast it before your opponent runs out of cards. The main thing about it is that you usually want to play a little mini game here where you wait for your opponent to play out 
you wait for your opponent to skip a power for his turn. If he skips a power for his turn, that means that he doesn't have any power in his hand, which means that his hand only has good cards left in it, so you can subvert and always get a card that is not power. That's a really, really good way to do it, but of course sometimes you just want to subvert for a power because you need that power to cast something big, and you're going to be trying to like weigh down on your opponent with big stuff, and maybe you don't want your opponent to have that power to cast like a Karia or something like that. Uh, subverting a Karia, always fun. I think the only time that I feel bad about subverting is when I subvert a subvert and then subvert another subvert, which has happened to me twice and both times has lost me the game because I've just sort of been dirtling in hand while my opponent has been playing all of his cards that weren't subvert. <laughs> <laughs> card does represent some tempo loss, but it's a very, very strong draft bomb, and it belongs in quite a few different rank decks. A Shard of the Deadshot, Deadly Quick Draw 6-3. Uh, because of its torch ability at 5, uh, that can make it a little bit rough in ranked, but this card is amazing in draft because it is uh, really, really solid as a push card that deals a ton of damage, has to be blocked, and... Uh, of course, a Shard of the Deadshot having Deadly and Quick Draw can be blocked by as many as six different units and kill all of them and still survive. Fastest gun in the West? I would say so. Uh, I really like the six-shooter theme of her. I think that's pretty cute. Uh, I think that uh, overall, I really like the design of this card. Uh, she is a little bit cheaper now. She used to cost six, and now she's just better, so makes a really, really solid draft card. Uh, a bit tough and ranked just because three health is three health, and three health is pretty tricky. And also, this is not the same as flying. You do actually sometimes get chump blocked here, and that means that a Shard of the Deadshot can't necessarily close out the game on her own without a significant amount of time and power invested, which is not to say that she's not amazing in draft, and I think she's a, a solid draft bomb. Grasping at Shadows, play a unit from the Void. The card is merely okay in draft, but very, very solid in ranked, because you can play it in fun reanimator decks, and fun reanimator decks can grasping at Shadows a lot of things that are very, very scary, and tend to cost like 8 or 10. Uh, the things that I think are most amazing here are Snowcrush Animist, the card that stuns and kills a bunch of different units on the board as a summon effect, Vara the Fate Touched, who gets more units back from the Void, including other Varas, and uh, uh, the big one is Scourge of Frost Home, which is a 10-cost unit that locks down your opponent and prevents them from casting spells. If you play Grasping at Shadows on Scourge of Frost Home, that can just end the game for some types of control decks. So yeah, crazy fun card for reanimator decks. Uh, reasonable enough in draft, but not amazing. Lurking Sanguar. Free if two units dealt damage to the enemy player this turn. 4-2 Lifesteal. Nothing to write home about on those stats, but it's actually okay, if not amazing, for 5. Lifesteal is a pretty strong effect. Lurking Sanguar is a pretty cool effect. And, like, you know, overall, like, this card's just not bad. Uh, it's definitely very good in Rush Jito decks. I think that you can definitely get a lot of value out of it in that. In Draft, I would say it's a fairly solid rare. Not anything special, but the Lifesteal does mean that it's going to trade with something and also get you some tempo back, which can put a damper on a lot of the more aggressive decks. Merciless Stranger. Strangers are deadly. 3-3. Three, three. Uh, three, three stats are really interesting. Like... I suppose you have to do something to make this stranger cost 5, uh, but he doesn't need to be a 3-3. Three, three. It, it's completely meaningless. He could be a 1-1 one, one and he'd be basically the same stranger, or a 3-1 or something like that. You know, like I, I think that overall this card's a little bit overcosted for a stranger, and strangers have some potential to be a lot better, so this card could get a lot better in ranked as set 2 comes out, or as we see more strangers coming out. But uh, right now, he's not any good in ranked. And in draft, he is solid enough. You definitely have a lot of fixing strangers, so putting this card down allows you to push through for a decent amount of damage. He's just not my favorite thing to be doing at 5 in draft, but he's okay. Oblivion Spike. Plus one attack for each of your units in the void. This is a 0-5 weapon for 5. So... Lots of things about this card, but I think this card is often stronger than Bloodrite Callus in token decks that really want to do a lot of crazy things on that front. The main thing about it is that that 5 health is actually just a really meaningful amount of 
health. Uh, Oblivion Spike is almost always a two for one and can also protect against some really nasty things like Torch Lethal, just like basically if your opponent's trying to flame blast you out, Oblivion Spike is just kind of a thing that uh, really puts a damper in that plan and makes it kind of rough when you are like sitting on the last part of the board. Like he's just a very, very, very good card for when both sides have run out of cards and you're sort of in that late game and i think that since he's usually played at that time yeah it's a really solid card and ranked i like it in draft as well this card just always gets a decent amount of value and uh usually pushes for a bunch so uh can be an insane weapon usually just ends up as like a 3-5 weapon and a 3-5 weapon is very respectable Stray into Shadow, all units get negative 4 health. This is a Jax Bounty card, so it is not available in Draft. In Ranked, it has proven to be fairly underwhelming, but not out of the question for certain types of decks. It definitely clears out tokens just really, really well. Uh, it doesn't kill a lot of things that you would otherwise want it to kill. Argentport Ringmaster, uh, Sandstorm Titan. There are a lot of things that are 5 fives and not that many things that have only four health, but are also pretty dangerous. Uh, Seraph is the only one I can think of that's particularly nasty. Stray into Shadow just usually ends up not quite doing enough, but it is a very, very good card as a pseudo harsh rule in Shadow, so you can use it to set up some control decks and get like your extra harsh rules in and do some pretty decent stuff. Uh, card also shuts down Dawnwalkers really hard, makes sure that a lot of units that would otherwise be coming back from the void do not come back from the void. Uh, overall, it's sort of a meta card, but it is pretty decent and ranked. Umbrin Reaper! Flying in Tomb, deal 5 damage to the enemy player, and you gain 5 health. This is a 5-1 for 5. This card's amazing in ranked or draft because it is just such a tremendous damage swing. At 5, this card usually represents around 10 damage dealt and 5 health gained. Uh, very often, like at the very least, your opponent spends a removal spell to take 5 damage and give you 5 health, which is just, oof, that's such a beating if you're trying to swing for tempo. Also, also this card is a flyer, so he's immediately a draft bomb because he is a big evasive unit that flies, so that's that's just, you know, straight up something that you want in draft, but even if you can kill him, that damage is enough to really swing a draft game in your favor. And likewise, he's a really, really strong card in Ranked. Uh, in Ranked, he's especially good because you can play him with cards like Vara the Fate Touched and Dark Return, and just keep getting him back. Uh, getting him back one to two times is usually enough to just end out a game. And if you're playing him Stone Scar decks, then of course this card is going to be dealing the damage and gaining you health, which is very good, but also enabling you to kill people with Obliterate for lethal. So yeah, Umbran Reaper's nuts. Uh, really just A plus in both draft or ranked. Ringmaster, infiltrate, play five random units from the enemy void. An absolute draft bomb, even though it does not always get to run across for the damage that it needs to do. Has a really fun voice line. I don't remember the exact uh, wording of it as it goes right now, but uh, just a delight to have uh, attacking in. Uh, so the five at random enemy units from the enemy void is usually enough to just end the game if Ringmaster gets his infiltrate. This is probably the most powerful infiltrate that exists right now. Uh, Direwood Beast Color is not as good. Gorgon Fanatics is very, very strong. But yeah, Ringmaster, I would say, is the strongest infiltrate in the game in terms of raw value. So very, very solid in terms of all of the stuff that it can do. Uh, if you can sneak this infiltrate across in ranked, it's well worth it. But of course, as a six drop that is monocolored, it's usually not going to live long enough to actually get the damage that you need. Still, decent card to be playing down in top deck mode. Uh, I wouldn't say it's amazing and ranked. I would say it's an absolute draft bomb. Direwood Rampager, boring 6-4, very bad and ranked, uh, actually okay in draft. That that amount of damage is worthwhile to be pushing. It's an interesting premium effect, I must say. Not not really sure what's going on, but uh, <laughs> fancy. Horse Snatcher Bat, 5-3 flying quick draw. This card is another draft bomb, just because it is... Uh, really, really crazy, big evasive unit with uh, not only uh, flying, but also quick draw, which means that it can't be blocked by other flyers. So crazy fun on that front. Uh, this card puts your opponent on a five turn clock regardless of what health they're at. And uh, overall, it's just going to push across for a lot of damage in draft. In ranked, three health, six cost. That's uh, risking it, I would say. Not really going to do a heck of a lot for you. There are better flyers to be playing in ranked. 
Spirit Drain, deal 4 damage to a unit. Actually pretty solid in draft. Um, tends to get thrown by the wayside a little bit more often than it should be, and I am guilty of this as well. But being able to deal to kill a unit and also get a bunch of health back late in the game is just good. Like, it's, it's very good value. It's very good rate. Can swing a game completely. I would say that overall this card is fairly strong. Um, and uh, I, I just don't draft it enough. In ranked, uh, too slow. Doesn't do enough. But uh, fun nonetheless. Whispers in the Void. The Tormentor appears in the Void. The Tormentor is an 8-8 unit with flying overwhelm charge. At the start of your turn, if the Tormentor is in your Void, you play a 1-1 Spiteling, which is an Entomb with deal 1 damage to the enemy player. Did you get all that? Because, yeah, uh, fun old card design in a digital landscape. You could not print this card in Magic, and I really, really like it. Uh, this is a really fun mini game. Uh, the Tormentor is a really interesting sort of final boss type thing going on um let's see what what can we say about him so the spitelings are usually the reason that you play whispers in the void they will eventually overwhelm your opponent they always represent at the very least an inevitability engine that will kill your opponent in a slow control deck uh, they also work pretty well with cards like xenon obelisk or Vault of the Praxis. Uh, there's a lot of fun things that can use Spitelings to do a lot of other fun things, but because of that Entomb effect, no matter how many you're generating, you can always just sacrifice them and send out more. So once you play Whispers in the Void, you have the late game locked up, you just have to avoid dying. The other thing with the Tormentor, of course, is that you can, in fact, Grasping at Shadows it to charge in with an 8-8 Flying Overwhelm charge. Uh, I would say use that as a last resort. Uh, it's much better to do it with Vara the Fate Touched, because you're probably running Vara in this deck anyways, and that can definitely be a good way to secure a bunch of damage. Of course, if you do it that way, he might get silenced, and then, well, he won't be in your Void making Spitelings anymore, but really, Whispers in the Void will just create a, a fairly fun inevitability engine. The main risk here is that it's slow as heck, and it gives your opponent all the time in the world to respond to you. But a uh, pretty solid card in ranked. Oh gosh, this card is good in draft, actually. <laughs> you have to get four shadow, so you have to draft very specifically towards shadow. But yeah, no, it's it's pretty good. Oh, Jeral Iceheart as an infiltrate effect. Yeah, that one is on par with Argentport Ringmaster. Uh, but I I would say that Ringmasters is a little stronger. Azendel's Gift. At the end of the cursed player's turn, that player discards their hand. 7 cost, 3 shadow influence. This card used to cost only 1 shadow influence, and uh, it was splashed in everything because, yeah, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, this is a card that you use to mitigate slow decks and just basically make sure that the meta never gets too slow. So... This will punish all of the control and mid-range decks in the world. It's very, very solid to play down on them. Uh, there are ways to protect against it. You can decay it, you can protect yourself, you can uh, Celestial Omen for a Mistville Drake and get yourself an Aegis that way, uh, or an Aegis as the case may be. Um, yeah, I think overall Azindel's Gift is just a really, really bananas effect. This card will usually get you around 2-3-1 to three to one card advantage, and uh, being able to force your opponent to never, ever, ever be able to hold a combat trick again in top deck mode is a pretty admirable goal for control versus control. You usually never run more than one of these because obviously you don't want to stack them and also you just don't want to have two, two seven drops in your hand. So yeah, Azindel's Gift is still a very solid card to be splashing into any control deck that can manage the three shadow influence and the seven power. Shadowlands Feaster, another Jek card. Uh, this card has flying and ambush, 5-6, when an enemy unit dies, it goes to your void. I love this card because it eats Akaria. Uh, <laughs> we haven't seen as much of it as I'd like, but uh, the flying ambush is a legitimate, meaningful amount of... Uh, it's a legitimate removal spell uh, on 7 that leaves a unit behind, which means it's usually 2 for 1 advantage that also steals an enemy unit to your void. I think Shadowlands Feaster is very worthwhile and ranked. Uh, definitely in the same type of slow, slow and nasty control decks that are running cards like Azindel's Gift. So yeah, reasonable card. Doesn't do an amazing amount of things, but it's particularly good against armory decks, so it's always fun to play it against those. Very, very fancy card. Um, oh, I didn't say if Azindel's good Gift was good in draft, and the answer is sort of. <laughs> 
Usually can't get to it, but it's okay. Venom Spine Hydra. Entomb, kill all enemy units. Card is underplayed. 7-7, seven, seven, kill all enemy units in Tomb. Sometimes you can play this and combust it for 8 just to board wipe your opponent's board, and that can be really, really good. If this card gets silenced, it's still a 7-7 seven, seven for 7. That doesn't actually hurt you all that much. I think that overall Venom Spine Hydra is a very solid control card in Felm decks. Uh, in draft, this is an absolute bomb. There's just no way around it. Your opponents are very unlikely to have both a silence and a removal for it, which means it's just going to push for a ton of damage. And uh, if it doesn't like actually get that damage, it will wipe your opponent's entire board. So crazy good card in draft. In ranked, yeah, this card hasn't seen enough play, and in the times that it has been popular, it has been very good in those decks. It was popular back in like closed beta in film control. And uh, I've seen it show up once or twice, and every time it's been quite reasonable. So I, I like this card a lot. Touch of the Umbrin, Lifesteal, steal the cursed unit for as long as it is cursed. So this one's an interesting one. It is pretty good value because you are removing a unit and also getting a unit for yourself, and also the unit has a buff, which is Lifesteal. Uh, like Permafrost, it can be silenced, which is basically the worst thing. Touch of the Umbrin really wants to steal cards like Sandstorm Titan, and Sandstorm Titan usually hangs out in decks with cards like Valkyrie Enforcer and Desert Marshal, which makes Touch of the Umbrin fairly unplayable in ranked. This is a draft bomb, of course, and in ranked, I would still recommend it. I think it's kind of interesting in Arjunport decks running Marshal Ironthorn, because you can get up to 8 pretty easy, and you can have some fun times with it. Uh, as a legendary, takes some work and probably not going to be one of your first crafts, but has some potential, is a really interesting advantage card. I like this card a lot, and uh, I'm hoping to see more out of it as lifesteal progresses. Vara the Fate Touched. You get one of these for free, so that's always nice. It is 6-6 deadly, which already, pretty solid. Good stat line, trades with anything, and uh, yeah, that deadly effect actually is meaningful sometimes. Whenever you play a shadow unit, including Vara, you play an additional shadow unit from the void, which means that Vara is always a two for one. Uh, she is almost never played in a situation where she's not going to get back another shadow unit from the void. And the fun thing about Vara is that she can chain herself. So if there are four Varas in the void and you grasping at shadows one of them, you get all of them back plus another unit. So Vara just steadily takes over games because uh, no matter how many times you kill her, she can always bring herself back, and she just really spirals things out of controls in the late game. I think she's very, very good. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. Wow. Well, glad we're down to our last two cards, because... Ah. <laughs> just uh, getting a little bit ah, snotty there. Anyways. Yeah. So, Vara... When you play a shadow unit, plays an additional shadow unit from the void. Just, yeah, this card is very, very good on rate. This card is a really, really solid control card. This card is probably the best of the Scions in terms of the overall amount of decks that she fits to fits into in ranked. And uh, she's very, very powerful in draft. So I think that definitely a solid Scion. Really, really good card. All right, two left. Uh, we have the last word. 1-1 one, one deadly quick draw. Pay nine to make the last words attacks deadly to players. So, <laughs> very specific wording on the last word's attacks, unfortunately. But uh, the thing that I like about this card, there are a lot of things to like about this card. This card is actually viable in ranked, guys. And it is a very, very good draft card, of course, for the same reasons that it's viable in ranked. Uh, but uh, only if you can get to 9 in your draft deck, which is no guarantee. You have to play kind of a slow draft deck to get it to happen. But let's talk about what we can do with this card. So Deadly Quick Draw means that anything the last word attacks dies, and the last word does not take damage back, meaning you do not lose the last word to whatever it is you're attacking. As a result, the last word plays really well in top deck mode, where your opponent is playing down a unit at a time, and you are just attacking each of those units, killing that unit, and then your opponent has to play down another unit, or else you will just ultimate the last word and make its attacks deadly to players and kill your opponent. Uh, basically, because of that sort of interaction, because of the power that it has in these types of setups, it makes an exceptionally good closer for Feln control decks in particular. 
most of the time the last word will get you at least one card's worth of value plus the card that is spent to remove it and oftentimes it can win you the entire game and or just value you out with like three or four kills before your opponent finally finds a card that can deal with it. It does die to a variety of things, uh, snowballs amongst them, the new alpine tracker, uh, there is lightning strike of course, you can decay it, you can torch it, you can do all sorts of things to actually make the last word go away, but uh, yeah, overall this card usually just ends up in a situation where you're playing it at the end of the game and all of those cards have already left your opponent's hand and he just has to draw into something or die. So. I like Last Word a lot. It's a crazy good card for control closers. The really fun card thing about this card is that it has deadly, and deadly means that you have deadly, and that means that your lightning storms have deadly, and your torches have deadly, and your tempers, and your obliterates, and really just whatever it is that you want. An obliterate with deadly in particular deals one damage to the unit that it's killing, and then five damage to your opponent, which is just uh, shiny and fun. Yeah, basically giving all of your spells deadly is a real fun time. The last word is a real fun design. You want one of these cards for film closeout cr control. You almost never need to play more than one of them. The Witching Hour, 24 power, 6 shadow influence. <sighs> Another really fun design that you just can't do in a physical card game. Play four Pale Riders. Those Pale Riders are all four fours. One has Deadly, one has Flying, one has Killer, and one has Lifesteal. And whenever you play a non-power card, you reduce the cost of the Witching Hour by one. This card will eventually cost zero, which makes it pretty fun. Uh, there have been a ton of fun interactions and combos with it over the course of a wide variety of games, and when it was play any card and not just a non-power card, it was just a simply broken card. As it is right now, the Witching Hour stands in a place where it is a pretty good late game finisher, often doesn't do quite enough to finish the game, unlike some other cards that you could play, but overall can be very very strong in certain token strategies. Uh, because of the way that tokens work, so if you play a card like Assembly Line, uh, Assembly Line is a card that you play, and then each of the tokens also counts as a card that you play, so Assembly Line reduces the cost of the Witching Hour by 4. There are a lot of different ways to cheat the Witching Hour's cost down to make it cheaper and cheaper. It's still not going to come out any earlier than turn like 5 or 6, but eh, when it comes out down around those times, it's pretty good. So if you can build a rank deck around it, I highly recommend it. I think this is one of the only legendaries that you really can't play in draft, but uh, it's tempting, and obviously if you can cast it in draft, <laughs> it's definitely well worth it. So yeah, really crazy fun card, and just a really lovely design to end out the shadow cards and also the set of monocolored cards. We're going to do the hybrid cards again soon, but that wraps it up for the shadow cards. For, so for the folks who are going to be watching this on YouTube, Thanks for watching, and feel free to like or subscribe. And uh, for the Twitch folks, uh, let's go ahead and say our goodbyes to you guys, too. Cheers.